Hi everyone, this is Dr. Jansen Kalalan, your lifestyle medicine doctor helping you in your recovery from cancer. So today's topic would be about brain cancer. So we're gonna talk about what brain cancer is, the statistics behind it, how common it is, your, lifesti- your lifetime risk of developing one, in terms of survival no, for, brain, for patients with brain cancer, how good, i- how good is it, our treatment options, symptoms, and uh, how do we diagnose brain cancer. So as of 1990 up until 2019, there were 347,000 global cases of brain cancers uh, that was diagnosed. And during the same time period, there were around 246,000 global deaths caused by brain cancer, which showed a significant increase no, of around 76% during this uh, the same no, study period. Our, a person's likelihood of developing this kind of cancer in their lifetime is less than 1%. So it's actually very rare for somebody to develop brain cancer. And once you get diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, the, re- the five-year relative survival rate for this is around 36%. So how about the recurrence rate? Actually, the recurrence rate uh, depends largely on what type of brain cancer you have. So on average, recurrence rate would range around 20 to 90%. Okay? Um, and as you can see here in this table, the type of brain cancer which has the highest recurrence rate within five years is glioblastoma. Now, patients who are diagnosed with glioblastoma, after five years, no, 90 out of 100 of them would develop recurrence. Now, let's move to symptoms. Most common symptom of uh, brain tumors may include, you know, non-specific symptoms actually like headaches, seizures, um, difficulty in thinking, speaking, or finding words, personality or behavior changes, weakness or numbness of a, or paralysis of one side of the body. So this is actually very similar to stroke, no? This is specific symptom. Um, loss of balance, dizziness, loss of hearing, vision changes, um, disorientation, memory loss. So if you notice, there are actually a lot of symptoms of brain cancer and they are very non-specific. However, here's the thing. Different parts of the brain control different functions. So brain tumor symptoms will vary depending on where the tumor is located. For example, a brain tumor located at the cerebellum, which is around at the back of the head, no? uh, right around the base, the patient would manifest dizziness, loss of balance, uh, difficulty in walking or ambulation, um, problems with coordination. What are the factors that predisposes you to develop brain cancer? Now, please take note, no? The cause of brain cancer hasn't been identified yet, okay? There are just certain factors that we do or that we have that predisposes us to develop this kind of cancer but not necessarily cause brain cancer. So the most important uh, risk factor uh, among all is age. So extremes of age, children, young, especially kids no, and older adults are more prone to develop brain cancer. Another one would occupational risk factors, especially if you are working in an industry where you are exposed to chemicals or different chemicals. So next is family history. Now, genetics can also play a significant role in the development of brain cancer. However, only 5% of brain cancers are attributed to genetic factors. So next is ionizing radiation. If you were exposed to a previous treatment or you were previously exposed to ionizing radiation or any radiation exposures, then that would be also a risk factor for you to develop brain cancer. Next would be exposure to N-nitroso compounds. So what is this N-nitroso compounds? Where can we get this? So number one source of this would be nitrates and nitrites found in cured meats. In short, processed meats okay another one would be cigarette smoke now if you are fond of eating processed meat if you are a smoker then you can be more prone to develop brain cancer as well and lastly consumption of alcoholic beverages this one i do not need to explain okay alcohol can cause cancer different kinds of cancers actually so now how do we diagnose brain cancer we have various options no that we can uh, use and the, the first one would be imaging, brain imaging. So we can opt for CT scan or MRI. Both should be contrast enhanced. No, another one would be biomarkers. However, uh, biomarkers are usually molecules or molecules in the blood that tend to increase when we have when we develop uh, cancer. However, 
For biomarkers, these are very non-specific, so please be very careful when using uh, biomarkers uh, for screening. Biomarkers should only be used for or um, to monitor response to treatment. And lastly is biopsy. Biopsy is when you get a little bit of the tumor and study them under the, under the microscope. This is the main diagnostic modality for us to diagnose brain cancer. This is the confirmatory test. Lastly, how do we treat brain cancer? We have a number of options that we have. Number one would be chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. Now, depending on the size of the tumor and the extent of which it has spread, surgery may be an option or it may not be an option anymore. The same with radiation therapy. However, the mainstay would be a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Now, for chemotherapy, we use uh, various chemotherapeutic drugs. The most famous one would be timozolomide. Another one would be carmustine and vincristine, etc. Second one is radiation therapy. So, for radiation therapy, we have a number of options. Number one would be whole brain radiation therapy. Another one would be IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. For intensity modulated radiation therapy, the radiation beam is actually molded based on the shape of the tumor. So, the healthy tissues or the healthy brain tissues are not affected at all. And lastly, we have the SRS or what we call as the stereotactic radiosurgery. So the stereotactic radiosurgery is a radiation beam or no? intensified high enough to bombard the tumor. So SRS may only be used for tumor up to a specific size, usually less than 4 centimeters. Um, however, SRS is actually equivalent to surgery the therapeutic effects of SRS. Actually, I have seen a patient who underwent SRS back when I was still an intern in St. Luke's Medical Center. Um, this patient have had multiple brain metastases. No? Actually, there was nine that uh, the doctors were able to identify. And uh, all nine brain tumors, uh, 24 hours after, the patient is now able to ambulate or walk. No? So. SRS is actually a very effective um, modality, treatment modality for brain cancers, okay? be it a primary brain tumors or brain metastasis. And lastly, surgery. So if you notice, the treatment options that we have for brain cancer is actually very limited. And more often than not, they have a lot of side effects. So let's take a look a few examples. No? Number one would be timozolomide, which is the most famous one. Timozolomide is an alkylating agent. It's a chemotherapeutic drug. And its side effects usually are very detrimental to the bone marrow. So number one, it decreases your WBC count. So it suppresses your immune system. It decreases your RBC count. So it can give you anemia. It also suppresses or decreases your platelet count. So um, if you use timozolomide, if your doctor uses timozolomide on you, you can be more prone to bleeding, bruising, um, gum bleeding, etc. Other symptoms would be the more typical ones associated with chemotherapy like nausea, vomiting, fatigue, headache, loss of appetite, constipation or diarrhea, and hair loss. Now, cisplatin also has similar side effects as what you can see. The main difference between the two would be just nephrotoxicity for cisplatin, autotoxicity or toxicity in hearing. So people who receive cisplatin can have um, problem hearing, um, anaphylaxis as well. However, the other ones are quite the same, no? if you will notice. Now, the reason why I am trying to show you the differences or the similarities between these two chemotherapeutic drugs is that we have a way on how we can mitigate these side effects so that quality of life of patients who are receiving this uh, chemotherapeutic drugs would be better. So, one way would be to use PPAR agonists. So, what are PPAR agonists? PPAR agonists are molecules that stimulate PPAR receptors. So PPAR receptors are found inside our cells and when these receptors are stimulated or activated, it activates genes. So genes gets activated that promotes healing, promotes longevity, it enhances the immune system so that cancer cells can be killed off. And healthy cells, the, the healing of healthy cells would be promoted. So one application is this, no? the role of PPARs in radiation-induced brain injury. So this is actually very common for patients with brain cancer who have received radiation therapy. So what did they find out in this study? So they found out that PPAR alpha ligands inhibit the radiation-induced pro-inflammatory process in the brain. 
both on the petri dish and inside the body. Moreover, PPAR agonists were able to mitigate or decrease the inflammation that resulted to cognitive impairment. Also, another benefit of PPAR agonists is that it can help us manage other diseases related to metabolic syndrome like your diabetes, hypertension, heart diseases, which makes it ideal for uh, patients who have these kinds of illnesses, no? in together with uh, having cancer. One product that I usually prescribe to my patients who are receiving either chemotherapy or radiation therapy is Simply Nature PPARS because Simply Nature PPARS is made from a microalgae um, that has very high concentrations of PPAR agonists. So this article proves uh, its point no? because Simply Nature PPARS can protect normal bone marrow cells from cisplatin toxicity. Also, Simply Nature PPARS can help protect the bone marrow of patients who are receiving chemotherapy, especially chemotherapeutic drugs that have detrimental effects to the bone marrow like cisplatin and timozolomide. So that ends the lecture. We are now open for whatever questions you may have. All right, so another question. Oh, this is coming from Ms. Jeanette Ku of Child House Facility. Um, Dr. Jansen, is it possible also that um, vomiting is also one of the symptoms of brain cancer? Yes, it can, it can. Actually, um, vomiting um, is a very important symptom. <laughs> Okay. If you if someone vomits no, but the reason is something is something uh, wrong with the brain no, it indicates that the pressure inside the the skull is increasing, and that is very dangerous. Okay, um, usually doctors would have to immediately uh, release the pressure by burning a hole, uh, doing a craniotomy, okay, um, or else the patient will die. Okay. That is a, uh, a very important sign actually. Also, um, the, the pupils, if the, they are not responsive or one pupil is larger than the other, okay, that's also uh, another uh, another sign. No, So, yeah, um, vomiting um, can be a sign of brain cancer, but vomiting uh, will be uh, associated with other symptoms as well no? um, because of the brain cancer. Okay, And usually vomiting would be one that is, you know, already... Um, when that happens, the brain tumor might be already a very large inside. Okay. No, no. I noticed that uh, vomiting is if, if your vomiting is not because of something you ate. Uh, it vomiting often hints on something like serious, right? If if yes. you are if you are having like a heart pain, a chest pain, and then you're also vomiting, uh, that is like always not a good sign. If you are feeling vertigo and uh, headache, and then you're vomiting as well, uh, that's that's something usually is like okay, something is uh, serious. Uh, is that is that something our audience should take note of? Yes, no, um, because those, these are warning signs actually. Um, but um, again, no, with brain cancer or mm -hmm. something that is growing inside your brain, okay, or putting uh, or uh, something that is putting pressure inside your brain. Okay, um, vomiting is already one warning sign. Okay, when that happens, um, something urgent that, that your case is already very urgent and something has to be done immediately. Okay, um, usually before vomiting happens, there will already be a lot of other symptoms. Okay, that you're already experiencing. So, um, Please don't be hard-headed, okay? When you're already experiencing the, the symptoms like headaches, okay, dizziness, go see your doctor immediately. Don't, you know, um, I can do this. Real men don't go see the doctor. <laughs> don't do that, huh? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dancer. Uh, Dr. Dancer, I just want to read a very interesting comment here in the comment section. Uh, Miss Maria Beatrice Santos said, Dr. Jansen looks a lot like Kawi Klau, a Chinese actor. Guapo. Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. I, I, I feel so left out. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sheila, no, we, we are so left out. Nobody comments about us. <laughs> so this is our 112 webinar. Okay. Episode. All right. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, I acknowledge, I acknowledge uh, Dr. Jansen's guapo-ness. Okay. <laughs>